Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, the topic is the public health problem that is alcohol use. Stephanie Desmond talks to Dr. Kara Poland, an addiction specialist at Michigan State University, about the need to reduce alcohol use, a leading cause of preventable death. One idea Poland is advocating, increasing excise taxes on alcohol, which has been proven to reduce consumption. Let's listen. Kara Poland, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about alcohol excise taxes and how you believe they could really prevent a lot of alcohol-related deaths. So first, I guess I would like to talk to you about how you got to this topic. And I think you have a personal experience. Yes. So when I was in my training and my fellowship, about halfway through it, my brother died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound related to his depression that was a result of his alcohol use disorder. He had started drinking when he was about 14 years old and died when he was 24. So what came out of that? So what came out of that was just this passion for understanding both personally and academically what happened. My brother had been in rehab. He had all these opportunities to get into treatment. His sister was a burgeoning addiction doctor. So we had talked about medications. He had never been placed on medications. He had had all these opportunities to get care and treatment, which led me to kind of dissect back to where this all started. And it all started when he was an adolescent. And we know that the average age of first use is around 12 years old. So my brother was a little older than that at 14 when he first tried alcohol, but it was sort of one of those situations where he and a friend obtained a fifth of vodka and completed it together. And their first episode of alcohol consumption obviously had some alcohol poisoning, got sick, but really liked that feeling and kept kind of chasing after it as the saying goes. And so that led me to think about how can we prevent kiddos from that initiation? And that led me to how do kids get access to alcohol? Where are they finding it? Who are they obtaining it with? And how can we make that a little bit harder? There's always going to be people out there that think that alcohol is not very risky or that maybe trying it at a younger age may be protective in some way, which we know isn't true. So one of the ways that we can deter people from sharing alcohol with adolescents is to tax it, is to increase the cost and making it more cost prohibitive. We know that in general, adolescents are kind of opportunistic users. And what I mean by that is they'll use what exists when the opportunity is there. And so if we can make it a little harder or a little bit more cost prohibitive for that adolescent to pay somebody to go get them alcohol, will that have an impact on alcohol use? And truly what the evidence shows is that when we do increase excise taxes, which are additional taxes on alcohol, kind of separate from uh, the t- maybe the local taxes or the state taxes, that we see a decrease in alcohol consumption. Tell me a little bit more about that, what the data show. So the data shows that when we increase excise taxes, that we decrease alcohol consumption by about 6%, um, but that actually is greater in a younger population, again, because that cost is a little bit more for them than it is for somebody who's maybe more established in a career and has a more steady income. Uh, we also don't see that people defer money from other household expenses to alcohol. So we see that we're continuing to pay the rent. We're continuing to buy groceries for our family because it's another concern that people have if we increase alcohol excise taxes. Are people going to be funneling more money to alcohol at the expense of other things? And we really don't see that, although that comes up in conversation. So we've seen excise taxes in public health in other places, like smoking. I know some places have tried like a soda tax. And I'm curious what that has told us. 
So when we look at tobacco, it is the single factor that prevents smoking the most. And so when we look at how can we, from a public health standpoint, prevent smoking initiation, make it less likely that somebody continues smoking to incentivize quitting. We know that excise taxes on a population level reduce the consumption of tobacco-based products or nicotine-based products. And I know that you've written about this, that I saw that in 1991 was the last time we've raised the excise tax in the United States on alcohol, and it had an effect. Absolutely. And so just like we have increased the nicotine taxes over the year after se- over the years after seeing that success, it would be great to see us increase the alcohol excise tax because we do see success. And there have been other countries that more recently have increased the excise tax um, in on alcohol, and they have continued to see that general trend of decreased alcohol consumption or alcohol sales after increasing the excise tax. So it does seem that it would be currently relevant as well. So how do we do this? So we do this by working with our legislative partners. So writing our congressional members to talk about the importance of alcohol and reducing alcohol consumption from a public health standpoint, from a personal standpoint, from an adolescent substance use standpoint, all the way through adults that that are struggling with alcohol use or, or overusing alcohol. And, and we write our Congress people to see if they're willing to engage in a conversation around increasing that taxation. And there's been, WHO has recently weighed in on this, correct? Correct. So the WHO does believe that increasing alcohol excise tax would have a positive impact on public health by reducing alcohol consumption. So they are falling on the same side of this equation and really encouraging countries to look at ways they can prevent alcohol consumption or reduce alcohol consumption by increasing the physical cost of alcohol. I saw that alcohol use is the fourth leading cause of preventable death in the United States. That surprises me. I think people think of alcohol as fairly harmless. That's absolutely true. People do have the perception that alcohol is fairly harmless. There was also a study that was done by the Gates Foundation that found that anything more than a tablespoon of hard liquor in a day, so for, uh, 40 proof spirits, is actually shown to have negative health effects. So really, it is much smaller amounts of alcohol that are high risk for physical health as well. And we don't always talk about that. There's kind of this idea that there may be a protective effect of alcohol at lower doses. There's the concept of what we call in in science a J-curve, where at lower doses, it has health benefits, and at higher doses of something, it has health harms. But what the Gates Foundation study showed was really that J-curve doesn't seem to actually exist. So low doses or low amounts of alcohol consumption are not health protective, And so what we see is that people are drinking at what we consider unhealthy limits in the United States. We also have this culture of binge drinking, particularly in late adolescence, early adulthood. So kind of that 18 to 24, 26 age range where binge drinking is very common. So what is binge drinking then? Binge drinking is more than three servings of alcohol for a woman and more than four servings of alcohol for a man in a sitting, so at a time at an event. So thinking about our own consumption can be helpful. We also have to remember that we're talking about a serving of alcohol, which is 12 ounces of beer, but that light beer, that older beer, not necessarily the craft beers that tend to have higher alcohol content. So it can get a little complicated. There's lots of tools that you can search for on the internet to help you identify what a serving of alcohol is, but then also looking at weekly use. So for women, no more than seven drinks in a week. And for men, no more than 14 drinks in a week. I sort of tongue in cheek say that men turn into women at around age 65. What I mean by that is that their alcohol consumption safety limits reduce down to that of a woman. And that is because men actually have compound in their stomach that starts breaking down the alcohol before it gets to their bloodstream. And that doesn't work as well. We don't make as much as we get a little older. So that's why that change occurs. 
So Congress would need to institute this. Is that right? That is correct. Congress would need to institute this. What would we do with the money that we collected, in your opinion? I would love to see that money funneled back into treatment. So treatment and prevention, right? So how can we use that money to support increasing that health? Can we use public health campaigns to support reducing adolescent alcohol use? Can we empower treatment programs, treatment providers to become more competent to prescribe medications that can help people with the cravings that come with alcohol? We have FDA-approved medications that really do help with cravings, but less than 10% of people with an alcohol use disorder are ever offered those medications. So how can we increase the treatment infrastructure and the prevention infrastructure so that we can use that money to reduce that WHO fourth leading cause of death and to prevent adolescents from entering into that substance use? And alcohol use is rising, is it not? Alcohol use is rising. It really took a high increase during the COVID pandemic. Many places did not shut down liquor stores or alcohol out of fear of actually alcohol withdrawal over riding and entering our hospitals. Alcohol withdrawal itself can be fatal if not monitored. And so it's really important that if somebody has alcohol withdrawal, that they see a healthcare provider and make sure that they're safe to withdrawal at home without supervision or that they're hospitalized appropriately, whether that's in a detox or in that traditional medical surgical hospital that we all think of when I say hospital, but what type of monitored setting would be most appropriate for that individual. You were talking about how there are these medications. One thing that I've experienced in my life is I've seen that a lot of times people with alcohol problems don't admit they have them. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's hard because you're right that this social acceptance of alcohol consumption sort of exists out there. And I, I remember I very clearly, I had this patient a few years ago and he came to see me at the insistence of his uh, cardiologist. He had high blood pressure and was on five different medications to control his blood pressure. And so his cardiologist found out he was consuming alcohol, which can increase blood pressure. So he asked him to come see the, the addiction doctor. So this guy comes and sees me and he tells me that he has he has a drink. He has like a bloody mirror or two in the morning. He might have a drink late afternoon. He has another serving of alcohol before dinner, maybe a couple more after dinner. So it started to just add up to on weekdays, five to seven drinks and on weekends around nine to 12 drinks a day. And he had no idea that this was abnormal. He thought that this was just what people did when they retired. He had recently retired and he was making the most of it, right? And so just talking to him about healthy drinking limits and what that looks like, I never really diagnosed him with alcohol use disorder. I diagnosed him with alcohol misuse because that was clearly uh, uh, quite a bit more than what we talked about as healthy limits. So we talked about that and we made some plans to how we might reduce that alcohol consumption. And what was really funny was after a little bit of time, he called my office and said he was dizzy and lightheaded. His blood pressure had gone down with all those medications because he had discontinued his alcohol use to, well, he had not discontinued it completely. It gotten down to healthy limits. But I think that we just need to be having more of these conversations. You know, when you see your primary care provider, we need to be talking to our patients and we need to be talking to our providers about how much alcohol we're consuming, what that looks like, what our goals are, and making sure that the workforce is trained to safely and appropriately respond to alcohol use and be able to nuance that diagnosis out of, is it misuse like I experienced with a patient I just mentioned, or is it a true alcohol use disorder and building that competency in terms of being able to prescribe medications to treat an alcohol use disorder throughout primary care because it's it's not technically difficult. It's mostly that we haven't necessarily learned how to do it. So it gets scary because we don't want to cause harm to patients and that sometimes stymies our ability to move forward in terms of treating something that we haven't done before. Carol Poland, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace Sassiri. 
Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Ciceri and Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.